seated. If you have a Bible, and I hope you do, turn it over to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Um, today, I don't really have a title of the sermon or anything. I just, I want to talk about Emmanuel. Um, here, Christmas time is a, um, oftentimes is a it's 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 one of two things at the same time it's um it's a, a time of of heartbreak and challenge because um we're celebrating with without that voice that was there last year without that seat occupied that has always been occupied by someone or man or or someone who should have been here who's not here now for whatever reason and there's a whole plethora of those right heartbreak in the midst of Christmas season it tends to heighten it bring it more to the forefront at the same time it's one of the most joyful times that you can experience where you remember those Christmases past and the joy that was there and you know when you when you watch a niece or a nephew or your own child get get a get a toy and you're you're immediately like transported back to that moment when you got that toy that you wanted it was a bicycle for me like just the classic you know kid in the 90s I wanted a bike and got a new bicycle and it was I just remember like running upstairs and like getting that bicycle. It was this wonderful and a joyful time. But here's my fear. Um, We have, before I get to that, before I get to my fear about this, let me just say this. What I'm not saying is we need to strip Christmas of all that it is. And that we've been celebrating Christmas. I'm not here to like bash all the neat and beautiful things that we do for Christmas. I'm just saying that when they're, if you want to truly experience the joy that Christmas has to offer, it's through this person, Emmanuel. And so in our in our modern life and. The way we lived Christmas and experienced Christmas, we've we've sanitized this story. Right? When we think of the Christmas story, we think of what we're gonna do next week, and it's gonna be awesome with little kids and pretending to be Mary and Joseph, and it's sweet and it's beautiful. And it's great because we're highlighting the sweetness and the beauty that it is, and it is beautiful. Just like Christmas is joyful, but it's also heartbreaking at the same time. And to truly grasp what Christmas is all about, we have to grasp the one who is called Emmanuel. And so I hope to get some attempt this morning to shed some light on Emmanuel. So let's, if you have a Bible, and I hope you do, and you found your way over to Matthew chapter 1, I want to read just a couple of verses. They'll be on the screen if you don't have them. I would encourage if you don't have a Bible, we have them right over here. We're going to start reading in verse 18. I didn't do this last week, and Jason checked me. So if you found your way to Matthew chapter 1, around here we like to say word. Let's get into the word so the word can get into us. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. 
when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the one who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place in order that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet would be fulfilled, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph got up from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, help us to understand that you are Emmanuel, God with us. And may we not just flippantly move to like where we just throw out all the Christmas joys and things that we do and all the trappings that have been placed on it. But that we just approach and do those things with the, the reality that God is with us. He's right here enjoying it along with us. And that's why he came. But we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So when I, uh, this year when I was reading the Christmas story again, and I was thinking about how we sanitize this story and the, the American world and the life that we live, and I was transported. God, it's like almost, it felt like God just picked me up and placed me in a moment in time um, where I was back in... Um, a city called Arua in northern Uganda, and I was, I was sitting with these believers from Sudan, and the, these men were, were preparing to go back into the third most dangerous nation to be a Christian in the world um, to take the gospel for the sole purpose of taking the gospel back to their people. And, and I was reminded of this, this one brother who shared his story with me that when he was between eight and nine years old, he was basically handed a weapon to fight off the enemy to protect his, his mom and his sisters from, from rebels who would come in. And, and from a very young age, at eight and nine years old, he was already fighting by the time he was about 14, he had just had enough of the fighting. And, and in a culture where there's basically no Christians, um, he, he told me this story. He said, I looked at my dad at the age of 14 and I said, I have to leave. Um, he said that the way we're living is not true. I'm on, the, I'm on, a, I'm on a journey for truth. And at 14, he, his father strapped two milk jugs of water on his back. And he traveled through Darfur, Sudan, south into South Sudan, all the way through South Sudan and into northern Uganda and made it to a refugee camp where when he got into this refugee camp, he, um, a family took him into their home and he was staying there. And he, he said every night... Late, 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 late when it was dark, these people would come into the home and they would go off in secrecy into this one area and they would talk all, all hours of the night. And, and he didn't know what was going on, but what he felt was 
that he needed to go ask what was happening during that time. And so finally he approaches the, um, the owner of the home who had taken him, in, taken him in, and he said, I know that you all discuss something at night, and you have some truth that I've come to hear about. And, and the owner, the one who owned this house in this refugee camp, said, okay, tonight you can come. And that night, for the first time, this young 14, 15-year-old boy heard the gospel for the first time of these believers who were in hiding in a refugee camp. And he came to faith in Christ, and he realized that that journey that he felt God putting him on, back in his homeland, he had finally found it. And here's, I tell you all that, how do you think he reads the Christmas story? Um, it's different, I think. It's probably more accurate than how we read it. And I'm not saying it's bad to sit under beneath your Christmas tree with the lights and the beauty, with your family and the red and green blankets and all of that. It's good. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. But this morning, I want us to think about this, right? It's this beautiful story. It's Emmanuel. Oh, the joy of the Lord. God with us. That's the end of chapter 1. And then chapter 2 begins. And, and, and here's what we discover. Well, in, in chapter 1, we've already heard it. Mary... is a woman who's unwed, who's about to have a child. In an honor and shame culture, I would just encourage you to go study about those cultures. This is one of the most shameful things a person can experience. And now this woman is facing a life of shame. Like, a life of shame. The, the, the rumor mill is, is started. And it doesn't matter for her that this child is the child of the Holy Spirit, that it is the Messiah. No one, I mean, who's going to believe that? So accepting this reality that the Messiah, God with us, is now God with her, God in her, she's accepting a life of just the rumor mill. Ladies, Right? Men, Joseph now, yeah, he's going to do the right thing, but the rest of his life, right? He's the one who took her as a wife. Then the IRS of the Roman Empire shows up and they're like, hey, we want that money, money, money. And now a pregnant Mary and Joseph are leaving all they know to go to the place of his ancestors. This place, they don't live. They don't have any place there to stay. And they begin the long trek across the country to go to this place. And hopefully when they get there, they'll have a spot to post up. And then... As fate would have it, there's no place for them to stay, so they have to stay in a stable. And here's the deal: like we we don't really know what it was. Was it? A, it could have been a, a spare bedroom in someone's place. It could have been a cave. It could have been more like a wooden manger or or stable that we've seen. We don't know, but it wasn't good. It was definitely not ideal for a woman who was about to bear a child. Not to mention she's with none of her family. Right? Like, ladies, I know you love your husbands, but how many of you would like to just have birthed your child with just your husband in the room? Not in a room, in a, where animals are kept, right? Like, man, that's just not great. Emmanuel, God with us. Oh, it's so good, isn't it? 
And then you have this baby. There's animals everywhere. And then these outcasts, these shepherds, like keep rolling in, like wanting to hold your baby. Moms, like how many people wanted, you just wanted to, like the outcast, the shepherd, you want like just coming in like, Oh man, this is the one. We saw that like, yeah, it's all it's all beautiful. Hark the herald angels sing and all that. That's all great. But like this is a mom holding her child and now all these outcast like the worst of the worst in the society are showing up and they want to they want to like see this baby, hold this like this is the Messiah, right? Now you're in a manger handing your chi- your child off, your first child to to these this these ruffians. And then, we don't really know how long this this experience in in Bethlehem lasts, but it it lasts for some time because we're we're told that these magis from the east, these, really they're Persian slash Babylonians, probably found out about the story of a Messiah, of a Hebrew Messiah who would be born from Daniel all those years ago when Daniel brought that story over. And now these foreigners who are magicians, they're rolling into the capital city and they're, we don't know how many, maybe there's three, maybe there's more, we don't, we don't know how many. Here's what we do know, they cause a ruckus in the state capital, right, like so much so that the king there finds out about it. So their presence there had a lot more to do with just, it was more than just like doTERRA essential oils bringing to the Lord, right? Like something was happening here where your child is now the one that is on the mind of the king and foreigners. And now they show up bringing gifts to you. Imagine. And as they leave, an angel comes to you and says, hey, as if all this hasn't been bad, there's a price on your child's head. And right now, there are soldiers coming from Jerusalem on a five-mile journey to Bethlehem for this kid. And they're going to kill him. Get out of town. And now you leave the place where you birthed this child and you get out as fast as you can under the cover of night. Roman soldiers come in and kill approximately 20 to 30 children, boys that are the age of your child. And you flee now to not just a foreign town in your land, now you flee to a foreign land. And you spend, we don't know how many years there, and then you get word that it's safe to return. Herod's gone, but as you journey back, has anybody ever traveled with a three-year-old, or two-year-old, one-year-old? As you're journeying back, you find out it's Herod's son who's in charge in Judea, which is where you're trying to go back home for the first time. Finally, we get to go home. Okay, can't go back to Judea. Can't go back home. Gotta go somewhere else. <laughs> so you navigate north to this remote land called Galilee to a small little town called Nazareth. It actually means stick town. And in a place that's You don't know anybody. 
You set up shop. And so you go, and that's the end of chapter 2. Emmanuel, God with us, joy to the world, salvation from your sins, and then you get that. And over and over throughout that story, what you hear is, this happened so that the word of the prophet prophets would be fulfilled. This happened so that the word of the prophets would be fulfilled. This happened so that the word of the prophets would be fulfilled. What, what is Matthew trying to get into our minds? Here's what he's trying to get into our minds, that The God of the universe subjected himself to become a human, not just a human. That was his first three years. I, I don't, here's what I want to say. I don't know what you've experienced this year. I don't know what your life has been like. What I'm not attempting to do is to take away from the trauma and the tra- the challenging things that you may and may not have experienced in your life. But what I'm saying is this. The Christmas story tells us this. That that we have a God who's not just off somewhere out in the stars distant from us. But that we have a God whose heart is driven by a desire to be with you in the midst of the messy, broken, challenging things, so much so that he would subject his life and his being to that, the first three years of his life. And he did it willingly so that he could be with you. So that he could be with you. So what's... Why would God do all that? And I think I have it written on a slide. Why would God do all that? Yahweh went through all this so that what was lost in the, gar- in the garden could be restored. So that we would know what it's like to sit next to God. And that he would know what it's like to be next to you again. Just as much as we long to be with God, God has longed to be with us. You know what? Not just as much, more. Even if it takes becoming a little baby. And causing a life of a life of shame in one sense, even though it wasn't it was false and untrue, it was her experience, a life of shame for Mary and Joseph in their lives and the ridicule that they experienced. All of that brokenness. So that he could be with you again. So that you could be with him again. I was... um, Before I get there. It's in times like Mary, it's in times like chapter 2 of Matthew. We're on the run. We're in a place that we, we don't know, any, we don't have anywhere to stay, full of fear. We don't have anywhere to go. What do we do? How does this work? Right? Those are the moments in life where we ask a question. Where are you at, God? Right? These are the, these are the times. Where is God? Where is God, right? These are, and and this story of the Christmas is a resounding answer. 
gives us the resounding answer throughout human history will always be the answer to this question. So yesterday, um, I was doing uh, some work at the house and I was at the garage, had the garage door up. And JoJo uh, kind of learned how to re or ride her bicycle without training wheels before I left, but she really like honed in that skill while I was gone. And um, so naturally she's like wants daddy to watch her ride that bicycle like constantly. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing some work uh, in the garage and, you know, every 45 seconds, JoJo's like, Dad, Dad, watch, watch, Dad, watch, watch. And she just loves going down the steep four-degree decline of my driveway into the street, right, and turn. And she just loves for Dad to watch her accomplish this Olympic-level feat. Over and over and over. And listen, I don't even pretend to be the greatest dad in the world. Mediocre at best. But as I'm watching my daughter, like, oh. I wanted to be more with her. I don't even know how to explain it to you. Like, I had this, like, thought in my head. It was like, I wish I could, like, shrink down and get on the bicycle with her and just experience it with her. Or, like, go back to when I was a kid and, like, experience being a kid with my kid in some strange way. I was like, just so I could be closer and more, like, in tune with her in that moment. And, like, I, and I was like, where is this coming from? This is some weird time portal thing that's happening in my own mind. And, and then it, and then. Then God, it just landed on me. God was like, that's exactly why I sent Jesus. That's what I wanted to be with you. Just like you want to be with JoJo right now. And like, no way can you get close enough. No way can you, like you want to experience it with her and be with her in this experience and that joy that you're seeing in your child. And you want to have it in a deeper, more real way. Like that is exactly how God, more, more than you feel right now, God wanted that. And so he sent his son to be right there in the midst of it all. I, I'm, re, I'm reminded of, C.S. Lewis's The Chronicles of Narnia, there's uh, The Horse and His Boy, which is a great book, and it's actually my least favorite book uh, for a long time, but the older I get, it's becoming more and more my favorite book because I'm actually um, maturing enough to understand what C.S. Lewis was trying to say. And um, it's about this, <laughs> literally, th the story's in the title. <laughs> there's like really nothing else that happens. It's about a boy and his horse. And, and he's on this journey, and this boy's had a rough life, and, and he's running in fear for his life. And he's on the horse, and they're just going to really, he doesn't even know where. And, and throughout his journey, he keeps, he keeps hearing this thing, like, running beside him. He can tell it's really big, and every time he stops, he can hear, it talks about, it just, it just describes it, breathing, just... Imagine being out in the woods by yourself with you and a horse and you're just a boy and you just hear this large thing. <sighs> grips him with fear, grips him with fear. And he knows something is out there. And he's thinking to himself in fear. Well, he runs from it at times. And other times it shows up on he never sees it, but he can hear it over here, so he drifts this way, and all kinds of things happen. And the whole time he's running for his life. And finally he works up the courage to say, who are you? Barely above a whisper is how C.S. Lewis puts it. Hoping that whatever this thing is, because he thinks it's in his head, it's not really there. And then, if you know about the story, it's Aslan, the Christ figure, the Emmanuel figure, who replies, 
one who has waited long for you to speak. I've been running beside you, right with you, waiting for you to speak to me. While the fear that you've been running, you've been running and running and running and all the hurt and the trauma and the pain and the joy and the laughter and the love. I've been right next to you, breathing, waiting on you to speak to me. So where is God? Well, then, Matthew chapter 1. Emmanuel, God is with us. This, this is what Christmas is about. It's about God with us. So this year, as we continue this last week going towards Christmas, Don't run from the pain or the joy. Whatever voice that is not in the room that should have been in the room this year or should have been expected, feel that pain and know that God is right there with you in the same pain as you, more so. More so. In the joy, when you hear, or some of you, you're like awaiting to hear that voice that you haven't heard yet that's coming. Experience the joy and know that God is right there with you, celebrating more joyful than you could ever imagine. He loves the Christmas lights, and he loves it all. He loves to be right there with you and experience it all right there with you. Jesus came in the messiest of messes, in the most broken of situations, to show us that in the midst of our brokenness, guess where God is? He's with you. And in the greatest of joys, Where's God? He's with you. We give Herod a really bad rap, but what I would argue is Herod was operating out of fear. He was afraid of all that he had and all that it was. <clears throat> because of this one, would be stripped from him. I think the same is true even for Eve in the garden. The, the serpent introduced a fear that didn't exist, a fear of not having something that you needed or that was good for you, and out of fear, she reached out out of fear. Her and Adam both took. And the same was true for Herod. And I don't want to speak on your behalf, but as I often say, I have a sneaky suspicion you're a lot like more like me than you think. And oftentimes I operate out of fear. Just like the boy on his horse. And I don't even want to speak because I don't know what. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just scared. I'm just running. And I want every one of you to hear this. I don't care if you've been following Jesus for 40, 60 years or you wouldn't know if Jesus walked in this room right in front of you and you've never followed him once. 
he went to unbelievable lengths so that he could be God with you. And he's just waiting on you to even give a whisper. Who are you? Say, man, what does it even look like to be with God? often looks really, really small. It's, it's moments where you're thinking to yourself, just like the boy on his horse, is there something out there? Was that God nudging me? Was that God with me there? And oftentimes, we can't even know for sure until after we just trust him that it was him. When the boy asked, who are you? He didn't ask it. He asked it genuinely. Who are I don't know. After he asked, he found out exactly who it was. It's in retrospect. so oftentimes it feels like I don't, is this God, is it not? Here's what I would say. Just start trusting that. Just take a step. God, I'm just going to trust that this is you leading me, guiding me. I'm going to take that step. I'm going to whisper. My obedience level is a whisper. Right here. And what you'll experience is a voice that resounds in the depths of your being. And he will show himself to you. And I know this, one, because I've experienced it myself, but I believe this book and I've seen it in other people. He will show himself to you in a way that will shake your existence. And it won't look like cherries and candy and nuts and all the things. Because that's not how life really is, is it? Where our need for his presence really shows up is in chapter 2. When we're running for our lives in a foreign country. And so sometimes we find ourselves there. Not as a means for punishment but as a means so that you would truly experience what it's like to be with God. Emmanuel. But it's our job to respond. Jesus came and he's made himself known. He is Emmanuel. And my question is, have you, have you introduced yourself to Emmanuel? Have you ever come to the place where you say, you know what? I want to be with God. Have you ever come to a place where you've said, okay, I'm going to surrender my life to this one who came and subjected himself to all of this so that... I could sit with him and he could sit with me. Stu, you can come. This is the Christmas story. The God who would show up to a 14-year-old in Sudan and send him on a journey miles and miles and miles on his own so that he could step into a home and hear the gospel, the story about this one named Jesus, Emmanuel. And so now that 
the young man in his 20s is turning around and making that same journey back to his people. Because when you experience Emmanuel, all the lights and the, and the cookies and all those things are good. But Emmanuel's better. And those things taste even better and are more joyful when Emmanuel is with you. And I long for that for each one of you. And I long for it more for myself. And I've experienced it, but God wants us to experience more with him. This is the story of Job. God said, Job's righteous. He's walked with me his whole life. How can you get any closer? And then at the end of Job, Job says, I've never even knew you. The way I know you now, I, like, it's, like I know you in, at such a more real personal level. In such a more joyful and wonderful level. So I don't care where you are on the spectrum of walking with Jesus. What you've experienced with him, there's always more if you're breathing He's right there breathing next to you. And he's waiting on you to speak. So I would encourage you to speak this morning. Let's pray together and then Stu's going to lead us in a song. or Whoever's going to lead us in a song. I don't know what's going to happen. But I know, I know the Spirit's here leading. I believe that. And so we'll let him lead. Let's pray together. Father. This Christmas season, may we be reminded about Emmanuel, your son, the one who's with us, who made it possible that we could sit with you again, and that you could sit with us and be with us again. As we enjoy all these holiday festivities, may that be the centerpiece, and may we enjoy all those things through that reality that you are with us. And Lord, may we be an example to the world of what it truly means to celebrate Christmas. Not in some weird, ridiculous way, but in this, the way that you would have, that you would be with us and it would be evident. So let us cast off all the other stuff and just for a season. Be reminded of Emmanuel. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand.